Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So today on the podcast, we wanted to talk about hair. Hair is important to many of us on a personal level. I know that I certainly have uh, spent my share of time, energy, and money on my hair through the years. And it's a powerful cultural and psychological symbol that turns up in myths and fairy tales across time and across place. So we're going to just circumambulate this image of hair and consider it uh, in particularly symbolically. What does it? What does? What does hair mean to us? And before we jump into the topic, I would like to let everybody know that we do have an online learning platform called Dream School. This is an opportunity for all of you that are interested in interpreting your own dreams and understanding more about symbolism in general. To join us in Dream School, for one fee, you're able to learn over a 12-month period a tremendous amount about how dreams are approached, how to understand them, how we use them. We also have online learning communities, live Q&As, and many other ways of interacting with the three of us. So, if you're interested, pop over to our website, thisunionlife.com, click on Dream School, and if it's the right fit, join us. So, hair. Hair we are. Hair we are. <laughs> I'm sorry. There, I think there's going to be a lot of that today. Oh. They're just endless puns with hair. It's a hairy situation. Yeah. <laughs> grown. <laughs> you know, I'm really resonating, Lisa, to what you said about, um, you know, as another uh, woman in today's culture, mm -hmm. not that it's unique to either women or this culture, but, uh, you know, the hours and time and devotion to <laughs> hair dressing, hair cutting, mm -hmm. hair curling. Oh, my goodness. I think about Back in high school, this really dates me, uh, was the era of home permanence. Oh. <laughs> it, it was really imperative to try to have curly yeah. hair. Wow. Um, you know, now straight hair is more valued, but I know. In, in a lot of places, long straight hair. But uh, we pay a lot of attention, and so has every other culture across mm -hmm. time and around the world paid attention to the hair on your head. Of course, mm -hmm. there's also body hair, but just head hair is a symbol and a topic of huge importance everywhere. Well, hair is also really interesting in as much as it's one of the few aspects of the body that is constantly changing. Hmm. From childhood to adulthood, of course, our bodies change, but it's very slow. But changes in the hair happen just within a few weeks. So there's something kind of magical about the fact that the body produces hair. Yes. And that it reflects so many different valences. For instance, as our health changes, that's also reflected in the hair. Healthy hair often suggests that nutritionally, metabolically, we're also healthy. The converse also being true. So I can imagine that, as with many other naturally occurring things, we have instinctive reactions mm -hmm. to how people smell, the color of their skin, is their hair healthy? And that's something that evolutionary psychology also pays right. attention to. Mm -hmm. You know, on the topic of evolution, I mean, it, that, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it exactly that way, Joseph. But I remember someone once pointing out that when we talk about, you know, kind of what's the difference between Homo sapiens and other primates? We like to talk about opposable thumbs and you know big brains, but but really, like, what's up with our neck, or the fact that we only have hair on our heads? Like, what what these are things that set us apart too. And 
what's sort of the purpose of it? And of course, I mean, I think this is what you were alluding to. Hair probably evolved as a secondary sex characteristic. So it's meant to signal things like health, fertility, attractiveness. And, you know, we know that this is clearly important. I mean, uh, any beautiful woman, any model, part of part of what makes her beautiful, part of what we pay attention to is her hair. And when we describe uh, an attractive person, we will almost always mention the hair. What is the hair like, especially for women, but but for men too. So it, hair does signify um, health and sort of a, a personal life force. It goes mm. r- immediately into symbolism of a beautiful, big, thick head of hair signifies power and virility or fertility. And of course, it grows out of our heads, so um, it may also signify our brain power <laughs> coming coming out of our head. Um, but mainly, it's it's a lot associated with life force. I too have read about um, our heads of hair as as definitely being a secondary sex uh, signifier of of attractiveness and availability, and um, long flowing locks versus braiding it, tying it up, mm-hmm. uh, you know, hiding it. Mm-hmm. Now, it's very much associated with sexuality. And and like you said, Deb, with kind of power as well, and, and we're right into the story of Samson. Aha. So do we want to tell that story briefly? Well, Samson had never cut his hair. It was a part of his tradition, and never in his life had he cut his hair. So was incredibly long, and it was the source of his power. And then he fell in love with um, a woman who uh, really seduced him uh, in order to rob him of his power. So there are f- famous uh, scenes of Samson falling asleep uh, with his head against Delilah's lap while Delilah is uh, shaving his head or cutting his hair. Mm-hmm. And that was the end of Samson's uh, noteworthy power. So it, it's almost an image of uh, emasculinization or something. And it has been so for women, too, that women, as a punishment, if you were thought to be a witch, your hair would be shaved. Uh, concentration camps, the Nazis shaved the heads of people as a sign of degradation, uh, powerlessness, and shame. I think that for many men, becoming hairy is a sign of maturity, sexual maturity and age. So an interference with that, I think, is a symbolic interference with that movement towards maturity. That's why in many cultures the ability to grow a beard was a sign that someone had achieved a kind of adult status or a capacity for that. Of course, we associate that with puberty. Consequently, to remove facial hair is to push someone or regress someone back into a prepubescent state, Mm. meaning that they had lost their potency, either quite literally physically, but also socially in terms of social standing. So in some cultures, cutting the beard is verboten. So, So, Joseph, I have to ask you, um, first of all, there's been <laughs> there's been this kind of beard resurgence in the culture in recent years. People are pretty into beards, and I've known you for a long time. And sometimes you wear your beard, you know, clean shaven, and I've seen it grow pretty big and bushy too. And I know you've shared that there are times when you feel moved to shave your beard. I mean, what what what's in that for you? I think the really strange thing happened about two years ago. I didn't want to shave my beard for at least a year. Uh And I got it down to like the lower part of my chest. It was like this (laughs) apron of a beard. Wow, Joseph, we remember. I know. (laughs) And I look at pictures of it now and I think, wow, it was not flattering at all. I mean, it wasn't like I was growing some kind of like Moses-like beard. It was really... You know, well, I don't know how to describe it. It was like fluttering in the wind. 
but there was something really archetypal about <laughs> having yeah. you know, a, a foot long beard. Um, yeah. It somehow signified something about my age. It signified something about defying social convention. Mm -hmm. I knew that it wasn't particularly flattering, but part of me didn't want to care about that. Yeah. Wanted to push it away. Yeah. All of my friends and family were uh, remarkably um, silent about <laughs> <laughs> the appearance of the beard. Uh, but what happens is after I shaved it off when I was done with it, they're like, oh my gosh, you look so much better. I can't believe you had that beard down, you know, to your nipples. It, was, uh, it wasn't quite controversial, but I don't know that it was flattering. But it was fun. I can't explain it. I can imagine that it was empowering. Uh, you know that you could do this if you wanted to do it. And I'm thinking about, you know, go back to that musical hair you know, where, where the, the lyrics go on and on about, you know, whatever it is, um, I'm hairy, high and low, don't ask me why. Long, beautiful hair, hair, hair. And then uh, there's stuff about, you know, is it long, is it curly, is it this, is it that, but just the glory and the reveling in hair. And that, you know, hey, what would happen if you just indulged yourself and said, let it go free, you know, <laughs> a declaration of that kind of uh, freedom from convention. Right. So there's something about hair and it's signifying either conforming to norms or expectations mm -hmm. or in defiance of them. And there, there are lots and lots of cultures where there were really, were our religious practices where you're supposed to hide your hair, shave your hair. You know, as many people know, I'm a big uh, Jane Eyre fan. There's the scene when <laughs> Jane is at that awful school, Lowood, Mr. Brocklehurst comes in and there's a girl with naturally curly hair and he says, this is an outrage. And I think they, you know, make her cut it off or something so that so that it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a way that we signal mm -hmm. that we are sort of of the tribe. And if our hair makes us stand out, and of course, that's a theme in fairy tales. I'll just uh, quickly share another kind of personal story. My, my kids sang in these youth choirs throughout their, their uh, childhood and adolescence. And it was very important in the choir that your hair be presented a certain way. You know, the point in a choir is no one stands out in a choir. You're not supposed to stand out. So you, the girls all had to tie their hair back, sit back. If the boys had long hair, they had to tie it back. You know, they they wanted a certain kind of conformity, and hair was part of that. So it might be interesting even to wonder on a personal level, how does our hair signal our conformity mm -hmm. or belonging with a certain group? Well, I think you're really um, touching into how uh, tribal customs really dictate a lot about hair, of that you, you will wear your hair a certain way, you will cover your hair, you will braid your hair, you will do what the tribe has dictated. Uh, at, but it's never just wearing your hair long and loose. Well, I don't know. I mean, some tri some tribes, you know, I'm thinking the, the youth culture in the 60s, that tribe was where you oh, were long and loose. Fair enough. Yeah. But that was kind of in defiance of convention. Yeah. Usually right. you're supposed to, you know, sort of contain uh, your, your wild, natural, hairy stuff coming out of your head or your, or your beard. And I know today, I mean, the, sometimes the girls who are redheads, you know, uh, really get picked on because they dare to stand out by having red hair that nature has conferred on them, but nevertheless, they're different. It's only 2% maybe of the population that even has red hair, and supposedly it's going to be going extinct. But standing out with your hair and doing something unconventional is a tribal affront so, and again, if we think about it symbolically, it might be an image of any time that we have a special gift that makes us noticeable and how that can make us vulnerable in a way. There's a beautiful Armenian fairy tale called Dragon Prince and Sun Girl. And what happens is in the beginning of this, it's a very long involved uh, fairy tale. I'm not going to even try to tell the whole thing. 
But in the beginning, the heroine, who is a humble goat herder or something, uh, has this encounter with this uh, numinous old woman. And she is rewarded, because she behaves well toward the old woman, with golden hair. And then she's uh, walking along the road, and the king's men are looking for a victim for the king's son, who is a dragon. And they, uh, they spot her because of her golden hair. So she, that's what she's called, sun girl, because she has hair like the sun. So it, it makes her noticeable, it makes her stand out. Uh, the, the very similar thing uh, occurs in the story Iron John, which is a, a Grimm's fairy tale that also features hair. The wild man in the story, very important image in the story of this uh, kind of primal masculine energy. Part of you know what makes him the wild man is he's covered all over with hair. And the prince goes to live with him in the forest, and the wild man says, you know, stay away from this spring. But uh, the prince disobeys him, and he, he's, you know, splashing around the spring, and uh, his hair gets wet and turns to gold, which, of course, marks him. So it is, it is sort of a declaration that we sometimes can't help but make. Well, I think in some symbol systems like the tarot, gold hair or black hair is used very strategically. And gold hair is meant to signify a kind of illumination of consciousness, mm -hmm. a kind of perfecting influence. Apollo was said to have golden hair, gold like the sun, and he represented a, a kind of male perfection. In the tarot, dark hair suggests ignorance, which in the magician key is bound by a white headband suggesting how we can limit ignorance with knowledge. So I think it does have many valences. I was going to pop back a little bit to what you had said, Deb, about identity and thinking very much about how when young men go into the military, their head is shaved. Mm -hmm. And it is a symbolic gesture of the removal of an old identity and ostensibly the beginning of a new identity I think this also happens uh, in other environments. Uh, Catholic nuns often, I don't know if that still happens, would have their hair shaved and they would take on the habit, which if you think about it, is a kind of representation of long hair as it mm -hmm. bounds around the head and then it drapes down the back. But as you were saying, it creates a uniformity everyone has the same representation of something cascading off of the head. Mm -hmm. So when we are in a kind of new beginning, whether it's ritualized by society or it's something that we ourselves try, often it has something to do with cutting the hair. I can also remember many instances with my analysis. Somebody would be um, going through a divorce Mm -hmm. and they would wind up changing their hairstyle. Right. Mm -hmm. I would see this for men or women, wanting an outer representation of an inner change. Mm -hmm. And it's initiatory as well. You know, that when you take the veil, Orthodox Jewish women, Hasidic women, uh, cover their hair uh, when they are married. Monks uh, famously have the tonsure. So it is a real um, mark of transition and change and often initiation as well. I am in a new stage of life. It sort of becomes an outer expression of an inner change of state or, mm -hmm. or perhaps a social change of state as well. And often a transition in as much as I had said earlier that hair is always changing. Mm -hmm. That um, <laughs> We hear this all the time, somebody makes a mistake with a hair color or a haircut. Right. This is a way of saying, ah, listen, it's, it's going to be hair. gone in a month. It's, it's just bad. hair. You know, <laughs> I, I loved that you brought that up, Joseph, and you, you said it's it's sort of, you know, this amazing thing that we grow it. And I was, I was thinking about hair in some fairy tales, and there is something seemingly magical about the fact that our bodies produce from nothing this uh, substance that can be quite beautiful. 
You know, it can look like spun gold or, you know, in my case, it can look like fine silver. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's this kind of remarkable thing. And, and that it, it is an image, I think, of something like our ability ability, the ability of the unconscious to be generative, to produce something that seems not quite of flesh, something that has a very different kind of nature than the rest of our bodies. And I'm thinking of this um, Scottish fairy tale called The Stolen Bairn and the She. In it, the heroine's baby is stolen by the fairies. And she has to try to figure out how to get her fair, her child back. And uh, she is instructed that she needs to uh, present some priceless things to the fairies in order to try to bargain with them. But she's very poor and she has nothing. So finally, she manages to create a harp from these bleached white bones that she finds. And she strings it with her own hair. And it's such a beautiful harp, and the melody is so sweet that the fairies trade for her with her child. And there's something about that which we ourselves produce mm -hmm. in this completely unconscious way. This is not something the ego makes. Yeah, and, and it's that, autonomous. It's Yeah, it's autonomous. And I, I think the same thing is going on in, of course, that very famous hair fairy tale, oh. Rapunzel. Mm -hmm. That Rapunzel's just locked in the tower. You know, she has no agency, and yet her hair grows and grows and grows until it essentially becomes a way for her to connect with the wider world and even eventually one day to escape. That same theme shows up in the modern movie Avatar, that they have these strange blocks of hair that they can pick up and touch into the hair of other creatures and create this telepathic rapport. So hair as a kind of mystical connecting force is somewhere rattling around in the back of our minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never have um, thought about it as a manifestation of the unconscious. And so I, I'm just still sort of dwelling on that, and especially the symbol of Rapunzel, you know, with this hair that is yards and yards long, it's uh, it obviously can't occur in the natural world, as as the compensation of the unconscious mm -hmm. for the imprisonment or the attempted imprisonment of her consciousness, mm -hmm. that she was not allowed freedom to move, to learn, to explore, to do all the things that uh, young people can do usually. So instead... She grew this mane of hair, and guess what happened? Of course, the prince comes climbing up her hair, and um, off she her. goes. <laughs> Interestingly, <laughs> it's also the ladder for the witch. Yeah, that yes. She lets down yes. her hair, and the witch climbs up to get mm -hmm. into the tower. But once the hair is long enough, anyone else that she chooses can climb up the hair. So it's also a symbol of a certain kind of agency. Mm-hmm. Because now she can extend the mechanism by which she can be accessed. So again, it says something about our ability to create as, you know, essentially from nothing, that which can connect us, um, can attract, can, can kind of change our, our story, if you will. And hair also is incredibly resilient. People go into the uh, tombs, into the pyramids, and hair will survive where flesh would not. So hair has this enormous kind of resilience. It was also used as love tokens in the Victorian times, mm -hmm, getting yes. a lock of hair. It might have been woven into a, a kind of object. So it's an extension that can be shared with somebody else, and it is as if part of them is being given with the hair. So it's almost like hair contains our essence. And we see this in, is it called um, spectometry or something? They can, take a, they can take a hair and do this kind of analysis on it. Again, I'm probably botching this terribly, but I understand that it, it's a really good indicator for kind of like long-term exposure to drugs or chemicals. 
Uh -huh. because traces of that will be in the hair. I mean, it is connected with our thoughts too, Deb, you know, because uh -huh. uh, it grows out of the head. But I, but I think it's almost more kind of our essence. And um, you can also determine a lot of DNA uh, characteristics uh, from hair. So I think, you know, as I'm reflecting on this, we're really coming to how autonomous and permanent and independent hair is. It lasts for millennia. Giving a lock of your hair to someone is a sign of a kind of permanent bond because the hair will not degrade. And in Victorian times also, people used to have mourning lockets that were made of the hair of the person who had died. Uh, again, a permanence here that is unique to that person. Right. And I remember my mother saving um, her, you know, the hair from her first haircut or something. And my boyfriend, who later became my <laughs> husband, wanted a lock of my hair. Oh. And he had it for years. I bet it's still around somewhere. Wow. Just so everyone knows it wasn't always gray. <laughs> <laughs> Which goes to the idea of dyeing hair. I mean, there's so many things we can do with hair, of course, with hair styling, cutting, Changing the color of the hair is something that also has been around for since ancient times, actually, because that transition from whatever the natural color was in our early adulthood to gray signifies a loss of something. The loss of pigment signifies age, approaching mortality. I think relative to attractiveness, it is a signal often that fertility has faded. So part of our culture so dominated by youth and beauty, there's an enormous pressure to create and recreate the appearance of fertility and of vigor, for that matter. Yeah, and, and likewise, gray hair is commonly associated with wisdom. I think that's absolutely true. <laughs> gray hair and wisdom, you can just take that for granted. <laughs> there have to be some benefits, right? <laughs> right, right. So, you know, I have noticed that um, I went gray early, and and when I let it let it go gray, that just the different reaction I had from people right away. So even though I was still relatively youthful, which I still like to think of myself as relatively youthful, but I'm I'm <laughs> less youthful than I used to be. Um, you know, I would notice that <laughs> people would give up their seat. On the on the train or or the bus, and and I would just think, what on? Why are you doing that? You know, I'm fit and vigorous, and and then I realized it's just my hair, it's just the hair that it telegraphs to to a younger person. It telegraphs um, frailty, and they must think I'm much older than I actually am. <laughs> but isn't it a fad now that younger people are dyeing their hair gray? Yes. Uh, that that is the color that a young person's hair could never be naturally. Part of that is uh, rises out of the anime mm -hmm. artwork mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that these uh, heroes and heroines in anime will show up with all kinds of colored hair, but this kind of silver hair is one of the aesthetics. It also reminds me of the um, quote unquote punk movement in the. 80s and 90s, yeah. and how surprising that was, even though I was a young person in Long Island, but seeing pictures of people over in Europe who had dyed their hair vibrant blue or bright <laughs> pink. Mm -hmm. it just, or, or wearing it in a mohawk. Yeah, it was so yeah. different from anything that I had seen. And now, how, how really common it is mm -hmm. to see people anywhere, even just with a lock of pink hair growing from the side, and how it becomes charming now, and not unusual at all. But it was a sign of real defiance when it was coming out of the punk rock movement in England. Just as you were saying, Deb, in the um, play Hair, <laughs> that was very popular on Broadway, that hair can be one of the symbols by which we signal revolt and rejection of the prevailing culture, and as a way of kind of putting a thumb in the eye of the authorities that are telling us how we have to groom ourselves or have to look in one way or another. 
I know that for me, and not so much anymore, but certainly for many years, I had dream after dream after dream about hair, about my hair. Mm. You know, that my hair, you know, that my I cut my hair or that my hair, you know, was suddenly very short or that my hair wasn't growing or that it was growing or all kinds of dreams about hair. I think that's probably not uncommon. Again, because it, it is this image of something like our psychic essence. And yet at the same time, it's very visible to the outside world. You know, I wrote down in my notes persona, you know, because I mean, and I think hair, of course, can can carry that, you know, that, that I'm going to I'm going to quaff myself in a way to convey a certain a certain mask to the world. And yet it is of us, you know, unless we're wearing a wig, it's ours. So in some sense, and I think this goes back to some of these fairy tale images, there's a way that we can't hide who we really are. We can try, we can wear a wig, we can, you know, crimp or straighten or, you know, use a perm, but 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 somehow uh, our hair defies us because, you know, if you dye your hair, what happens? You get roots a few, a few <laughs> weeks later. So it, it sort of is a tell about who we really are in a sense, I think sort of symbolically. And just as you were saying about hair analysis, telling people if we've used certain drugs in the last month, that our history metabolically and, and psychically is woven into the hair. It's kind of like a fingerprint or some other tell, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. It carries what's going on in us to the outside world for those who have eyes to see. Mm -hmm. and, and consequently, why going bald can be so disturbing for people. I think that all of us, you know, I'm 61 now, so losing my hair seems reasonable. But for young people that lose their hair, which I remember in high school, some of the fellows were losing their hair already, how powerful and disturbing it was to lose one's hair. Mm -hmm. And I think for many women who are not expected necessarily to lose hair over the lifetime, if that becomes part of another metabolic process, how potent it is to have the hair fall out. It certainly changes our appearance. And there is a gigantic market for hair growth products, you know, and reviews and so on and so forth. Do they work? Don't they work? It worked for me. It didn't work for me. It's very important. But the flip side of it is that baldness has also become, for males, a sign of virility. And there are women who shave their heads that are in the fashion and society columns of like, I and I don't need hair to be hot. I'm, here I am, th that it can go that way too. I think this idea of redefining something is really important. So the culture might say, ah, you're going bald, you're all washed up, getting old or useless in some way, and taking that and deciding that it's going to be redefined, just as you were saying, Deb, mm -hmm. that even young people will, shave their hair, and still feel buff and powerful and potent. And that's a way of kind of a reclaiming process that right. I think is really socially important. But I, I have certainly known young men who went bald early who suffered from a real loss of confidence as a result. And I, I think, you know, just to kind of build on what you were saying, Joseph, that it can, when it's more common... People seem to weather it better, but if if you're if you're a man who goes bald early, for some men that can be quite devastating. And it's devastating for women who have hair loss, whether it's hair that is thinning, uh, often after menopause or an autoimmune problem like alopecia. Women really want a full head of hair too. Sure. <laughs> Right. And it can drive people into hiding mm -hmm. in a way that's really difficult. Thinking about what you're saying, Lisa, about being a young man and having an unexpected hair loss in the most dramatic way, that can be alopecia. And for those who may not know, alopecia is this quirky shift in the immune system where the immune cells begin to go after the hair follicles mm -hmm. so that the hair all over the body, even the eyebrows and eyelashes, fall away and it maintains 
that loss of hair, often throughout a lifetime. And of course how difficult that is for young people. And it can create a real um, Fisher King wound. Mm -hmm. This sense of wound in one's virility, one's status in the culture. Very painful. I'm wanting to uh, veer at some point into body hair. Yeah, you know, I was just going to go there. Yeah, because we <laughs> we've been focusing really on head hair, but I think that body hair has different connotations and different meanings. Absolutely, I um, I'm thinking about the Queen of Sheba, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she, according to mythology. When she visited King Solomon, you know, she was reputed to have very hairy legs. Mm -hmm. And um, women, I think all along and certainly today, I mean, there are all kinds of depilatory products for removing leg hair. As if somehow body hair, especially on women, is somehow not acceptable. Yeah, I mean, it, it's associated with animality, isn't it? You know, the, the to be kind of covered in hair, and and that can that can perhaps be attractive in a man. But you know, men spend time and money getting, for example, their their the hair taken off their backs. I you know, it's it's seemingly more common these days. I think for young men to feel kind of disgusted by their body hair. Hair can become a focus of a kind of an OCD-like rumination, you know, body hair, wanting to get rid of it for both sexes. And an evolution of perception around body hair. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, for men, growing body hair was a really kind of exciting process, honestly. I remember as a <laughs> boy, and I probably was in the second grade, that on the weekends I had a little plastic shaving kit and my father and I would both lather up and I would pretend to shave oh, while he was so uh, literally shaving. Mm -hmm. So that had such a positive impact in me that when I really did start shaving and I didn't have to shave daily until I was in my early 20s, I have always and even still have this interesting positive feeling about mm -hmm. shaving Mm. as a kind of coming of age, as mm -hmm. one of the privileges, you know, of being an adult male. And remembering when I first started getting a chest hair, pubic hair, hair under the armpits, it was this striking kind of sign of becoming. Mm -hmm. This movement towards hair being repugnant, I think is, is interesting, and I wonder about it. And I, I'm... I'm sure there are historians who really look into this in a substantial way, but this shift of perception around male body hair certainly has happened within my lifetime. Mm. I, mean, I can say that in, in my 20s and even in towards my 30s, I never really noticed men being troubled about hair on their back or hair anyplace else or shaving their genital hair. And then this things started happening in the collective around removing hair and needing to remove it and somehow it becoming a problem. I, I find that interesting, and I wonder what that signifies in the collective. I mean, one way to look at it, of course, is uh, that there are market forces at work, because if, sure. <laughs> if, us, you know, if retailers and manufacturers can convince us that we should feel ashamed of something, then they've created a market for their product that will help us get rid of that shameful thing. But, you know, I, I, I'm not inclined to think that's the only thing that's going on. I, I do think that there are deep archetypal associations with things like hair, including body hair, and that uh, our reactions to them on a cultural level have to do with that aspect of things as well. I think a lot um, traditionally, and in a lot of cultures, this isn't new uh, in the history of, of the human race, that body hair has often been associated with bestiality, mm. with being close to you know animal life, mm -hmm. primitive, uh, mm -hmm. instinctual, Instincts, unconscious yeah. animals. And so to be clean shaven, to shave body hair or not have much of it, uh, signifies uh, distance mm -hmm. uh, from our furry-furred friends. 
I think Robert Bly in Iron John that I think you'd mentioned earlier, uh, Lisa, his theory is that there is a movement in the last couple of generations in overvaluing the puer. Hmm. That men were pressured or somehow decided to abandon a kind of mature masculine position and take on something passive, something non-threatening, something accommodating and boyish. Mm -hmm. And that corresponded with demonizing body hair. And so, as you were mentioning with the fairy tale of Iron John, restoring this image of the mature masculine covered chest back and otherwise with this kind of coarse red hair is a way of kind of reclaiming something around psychological virility and this resilience to having to appear younger or weaker than one really is in order to fit into the culture. And that in the fairy tale, Iron John is able to provide the young prince with all kinds of really helpful resources, which allowed him to be, you know, really a good king, Mm -hmm. a good member Mm -hmm. of society. Mm -hmm. So reclaiming the meaning of body hair as a sign of psychological maturity is something that he was trying to restore. And also reclaiming the instinctive, which I think we were saying earlier, that part of the power of Christianity and Catholicism was this demonization of the instincts, which is why Pan, who's the god of primal instinct, was used to model the image of the devil, that there is a missionary position in sex as a way of differentiating the way animals mate from behind and other kinds of distinctions. But all of this fear of the instinctive level and all of the innumerable ways that cultures and religions have tried to separate humanity out from that, I can imagine that is true. I mean, children have to rise out of their instinctive consciousness, even just through the first efforts of potty training, to have to control an instinctive force in order to participate in civilization. But that can go too far. And as Freud and Jung and all the other psychodynamic theorists let us know that if we go too far and we really attack the instincts, repress them too much, then we become symptomatic. Yeah. I mean, Jung said in all these different ways um, that that most of our suffering comes from being cut off from the two million year old man inside of us. And I I have to think that our two million year old man or woman was pretty darn hairy. I think so as well. So we come back to the 60s, as you were saying, Deb, and Mm -hmm women deciding that they're no longer going to shave their armpits, which was both a political statement and also casting off something that was really just difficult and unpleasant to have to do. Men growing their hair down to their shoulders or longer as a way of rejecting a kind of military hairstyle. And just flouting convention in general, the strictures of, you know, how you, how you do things. And I, I, Think about, you know, when I was in high school, Of there were certain hairstyles that were the, quote, right, unquote, kind of way to wear your hair, and dress codes and all the rest of it. And that then um, the cultural psyche um, staged a rebellion. And uh, it really was epitomized, I think, um, given, you know, great audience in, in the musical hair. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the lyrics are just too good to pass up here. I want it long, straight, curly, fuzzy, shaggy, snaggy, ratty, matty, oily, greasy, fleecy, shining, gleaming, streaming, flavor, and rex. And it goes on and on. Those that's only half of the lines mm-hmm. that say, um, you know, let's break through of these sort of tribal rules and just flout them all mm-hmm. and be in touch with our instincts as symbolized by hair. Mm -hmm. This is also something sociologists have studied 
greatly and have a lot to say about, but they have created a bit of a code around hair, hmm. just based on the analysis of various kinds of group dynamics that long hair, for the most part, is associated with unrestrained sexuality. And if we are standing in the supermarket looking at some of the Pulp Fiction uh, for sale, often the erotic romance novels will have a shirtless, muscular fellow with hair streaming down his back. And that's kind of a universal, at least European, sign of sexuality, that short hair or partially shaved hair often signifies restricted sexuality. Tightly bound hair or a totally shaved hair has traditionally been associated with celibacy, the cutting of hair, about social control, which makes me think about all of those YouTube videos of kids getting their first haircuts <laughs> and the incredible protest that kids mm -hmm. uh, give about having that cut. Mm -hmm. And that growing the hair long is also a sign, as we were just saying, of being outside of society. Mm -hmm. So there seem to be kind of common patterns throughout time of how the hair was dealt with having certain signifiers. I think we're in an unprecedented time now where there's an enormous tolerance for differentiation, particularly uh, in the U.S. and Western Europe. People can do pretty much whatever they want with their body hair or their head hair, and they're not getting a lot of explicit, uh, aggressive reactions to it. And I think that's good for people. It's a, a way of expressing your own individuality of you know all kinds of hair colors, um, all kinds of of hair styles. You know, I wonder if, in a way, it it also signifies a transition to seeing hair as a creative medium, uh, rather than you know initiatory or symbol of identity and and tribal. Uh, um, allegiance and all, all of that of just, this is something I can play with. I can change its color. I can take some of it off. I can grow some of it long. I can do whatever I want of depotentiating the significance, psychological significance of hair. It's just a thing. But I, I you know, the thing is, I think that when we're dyeing it pink or, or shaving our heads, we're we're not actually depotentiating the significance of it because we recognize the power of what we're signaling when we do something with our hair. But don't you think it also signifies playing, playing yeah. with it? Yes, but in it's but it's a very um, it's a very public statement what we do with our hair. So you could be playful with it, but you're being kind of publicly playful. And, and I agree. I mean, there is a real playful spirit with all these kinds of fantasy colors and all of this. But I think we have to admit that when you do something quite flamboyant with your hair, like dye it purple, you're looking for attention. It may be fun. It may absolutely be in fun. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's okay. There's no judgment attached. I mean, you know, look, I have pink sparkly eyeglasses on. Okay. So like, you know, it's not, it's not a bad thing to seek attention. But, you know, maybe we could just be upfront that that's part of what's going on. What I think might be new, though, here, and I agree with everything you said, it's a statement, and it's mm -hmm. visible, yes. and it's out there. Yes. But that my sense is that historically, hair has been taken more seriously mm -hmm. uh, than it is now, uh, that there is a playful spirit of, I can take a chunk of it and dye it hot pink. It, the list of, of possibilities goes on and on, and that I'm free to play with it now and make, make that statement public as well. Undergirding all of these statements, I would say, is the archetypal reality that this is something that says something about who we are. I think that relative to that idea of creativity, just as both of you were saying, changes in hair or signals to the culture, to the family, perhaps even to the political system. But I would say overall, at 
least in our culture, hair is manipulated in order to make us more attractive for the most part. Mm -hmm. That it's some kind of a signal that we want to appear positively in others' eyes. And even still, men are not granted the same kind of latitude that women are in general. Men are, in terms of hairstyle, are generally rewarded for conformity. And if you were just go out today and looking around, most men, their hairstyles are fairly similar. And that's true regionally and certainly in various subcultures. Also, the neatness of the hair is often associated with status and earnings. That if we see somebody whose hair is very tailored, their clothing is very nicely arranged, in the culture of men, we tend to associate that with quote unquote executive grooming. Yeah, yeah. Which means they have the time, the resources, and even the mental space to care about whether or not their hair is always looking just right as a way of signaling success in the environment. Men who are, you know, working 18 hours a day, six days a week, there's no energy. They don't give a damn about what their hair necessarily looks like. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of kind of communicating directly or indirectly something about status. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And then conversely, being overly concerned about one's hair is considered in the culture of men being overly superficial. So it's a tricky dance, just as we were saying about what, what managing hair does or does not. Coming to your uh, question that we started out with, Lisa, talking about beards, uh, I was thinking about that wonderful movement of being lumber sexual, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, this kind of movement uh, of young men, quote unquote hipsters, I don't know if that's the best term, of taking on these iconic images, these kind of Paul Bunyan images of wearing plaid oh, God. jeans suspenders and then <sighs> 10 inch well-groomed beards and uh marching into the culture in that way god now i've got the monty python song in my head mm -hmm. yeah, yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> but um but somehow that archetype of the lumberjack somehow mm -hmm. just jumped out in the yeah. collective and then became something that people wanted to embody mm -hmm. Conversely, Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, you know, all of the Hollywood blonde starlets creates this image in the collective and, and women are feeling this enormous pressure to have to dye their hair blonde. Mm -hmm. So there's also something about the icons that rise and fall mm -hmm. in the culture, which give us a sense of what we want to identify with. And going to your comment, Deb, about bald people... We look at this rise of heroic icons like The Rock, who is a World Federation wrestler, who's now a, you know, a well-regarded actor and a personality most people like, showing up with bald hair, which has always been something associated with wrestling, because you don't want somebody grabbing your hair to toss you around. So this association with baldness, success, muscularity, uh, status in the culture gets installed, rises up in the collective, and particularly young boys are watching that and getting this signal that, ah, oh, yeah, it's got all these positive valences, so let's give that a shot. Try it on. So we're so permeable to the collective in ways that I think often we don't even like to admit to ourselves. We don't even always know that we are, you know? It was... So I was talking to someone the other day who was saying a friend came over and said, oh, I, I really like your shoes. Look how cute your running shoes are or your, your sneakers. And then later they took a walk and the friend said, everyone is wearing your shoes. And, and uh, the woman who was telling the story said, I had no idea I had bought the it shoe. You know, you don't, you don't even realize how much you're sort of susceptible. And so what are the cues we're responding to in the environment? And, and hair, in some sense, is this 
uh, exchange between who we are, what we produce, and then what we do with it, how we respond to the culture. And when this goes too far, we can wind up with symptoms like trichotillomania, which is where there's so much anxiety about hair, and it can show up in a particular area of the body, the people will anxiously pluck the hair out. Mm -hmm. So trichotillomania is in that category of obsessive compulsive disorders, and some people will fuss with their eyelashes until they begin to fall out, their eyebrows. Those are two areas that seem very consistently to be something that people will fixate on. And they'll have a sense of agitation, and once the hair is removed, a sense of relief. So when we think about all of the valences that we've brought up today around unconscious dimensions, you know, something from the inside being visible on the outside, status, um, attractiveness, that we can become so worried, it can capture so much energy that we can worry at our hair to the point where we're starting to injure it or pluck it out. And, and that can be something that also causes great distress for a number of people. A last disorder around hair that I think is a bit intense is um, tryptophagia. Mm. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is where um, people will eat their body hair. And we know that animals do that. Cats groom themselves, and then they um, cough up a hairball. But in these rare cases of devouring hair, there have been some life-threatening results because hair is not digestible. And so some teenage girls mostly have had to go to hospital in order to have rather substantial masses of hair um, surgically removed from the body because it's interfering with the digestive process. But we can also think about that, the way that whatever valence the hair is carrying has to be brought back into the body, regardless of the risk to health. Mm -hmm. That just giving it away or making it visible or having it leave the body and then needing to return it into the body seems like a very powerful and troubled symbolic gesture. This has been an astonishing tour around something that we often don't pay all that much conscious attention to. You know, I know my awareness has really been raised about, you know, all of the identities, signifiers, initiatory, tribal, all the things we've talked about is that there it is, the hair on our heads is uh, providing a lot more information than we often stop to consider that it carries. And we can all reflect a little bit more about what our own attitude and hairstyle is um, conveying to everybody else about us. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, before we switch to a dream, um, I would like to thank our patrons. Uh, those of you who listen and, and appreciate the podcast and go on our website, thisjungianlife.com, and sign up for a contribution, uh, it is much appreciated. Um, for those of you who listen and like what we're saying, uh, we hope you too will just go to our website and, and sign up and uh, support us. Um, however modestly and generously you can. Thank you. And with that, we'll switch to a dream. And today's dreamer is a 23-year-old woman who works as a writer. I'm in the garden in a house where I grew up looking at a huge blooming flower bed with my mother who is telling me how to garden while she is going away for some time with my father. It is an extremely hot summer day and she wants me to remember to eat the ripe oranges and the yellow tomatoes. 
When I first look at the tomatoes, I think some of them are rotten, but it turns out that they are perfectly ripe. She also wants me to replant a blackberry bush, which I do immediately. I go inside the house, up the staircase, and get a frightened feeling. Suddenly, a weird little creature about knee height crawls up the staircase after me. It is black and has a tiny faceless head on top of a broader body. I know it is a mutated blackberry. It reaches out for me and begins to cr crawl up my leg. I kick it down, but it keeps on coming. It is needy and begins to fuck my leg, just like a tiny dog. I get a feeling that it wants me to take care of it, but I don't want it to depend on me. I feel desperate and start calling for my mother's help. So for context, the dreamer says, I dreamed this dream half a year after I moved into my parents' place for recovering from a meltdown after finishing school. Things had begun to change for the better. I felt stronger and I was starting to go more outside again. My parents had helped me a lot. And in the, in the, for the feelings, she says, in the garden, I felt great and enchanted by the beautiful flowers and fruit in the flower bed. In the house, I got a slightly scared, worried, desperate feeling. And she finally notes that blackberries were her favorite fruit in the garden as a child. I love dreams. They're just so wonderfully weird, aren't they? It's just so yes. great. Like one thing about dreams is you could never, you could never come up with this with your conscious mind in a million years, you know? It's like how our dreaming minds create things, sort of like hair, <laughs> that we couldn't do with our conscious mind. The autonomy of the unconscious. Exactly. What I am paying attention to right at the outset is, as is my predilection, of where the dream ego is at the beginning of the dream of what's going on. So she's in the garden in her childhood home. The flower bed is, is blooming. And her mother is telling her how to take care of it while she and her father go away. So everything is really pretty bucolic, pretty nice. And then the dream story says, watch out for the blackberry bush that is alive and pursuing you. And so the, the, the morphing of this lovely blooming flower bed and these beautiful ripe oranges and yellow tomatoes that are exactly right morphs into something more extinctive and more primitive and and more autonomous and alive that is pursuing her. And it gets worse. You know, it, it climbs up her leg. It wants to hump her. Mm -hmm. And she calls for her mother's help. But, of course, mom isn't there. Mom has gone away with dad in the dream. And in real life, she has been... She has been needy after having gone through a difficult time of parental care. One of the challenges with a dream like this is it doesn't have a clear lysis. Mm -hmm. That um, there's a bit of a crisis right at the end of the dream. Something's happening. The ego's not sure how to respond. She's crying out for help. And then she's woken up. So one of the pieces of advice that Jung gave was really to go back in active imagination for a dream like this and play it forward for a while to see if the unconscious can help you find the resolution and a place to relax down into. So she's in an active process, or at least the time when she had the dream. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the important things for me in this dream is how she responds to this mutated blackberry. And I see this as a theme in dreams when we have conflicted feelings about our own neediness, and maybe we have some shame around it, that, uh, you know, she just wants this thing to get away from her, but it wants to be cared for. So, of course, I wonder, too, about active imagination and, and maybe trying to get to know this mutated Blackberry. And it, it's, an, it's an interesting image, because what would it, what would a, what about a mutated Blackberry? So she loved blackberries. Blackberries are black, you know, so there may be some kind of shadow association there. They're juicy and they're sweet. So, you know, I'd, I'd want to sort of play around with that to wonder what exactly is the nature of this thing. 
Assos- there's some association with the garden, which I think goes back to the mother. This is a real dream of a kind of positive mother complex, but some difficulty in, in countenancing her own neediness. I think that's exactly it, and her own shadow mm-hmm. um, that you, you just mentioned, Lisa, that you know, when she was a child, um, these blackberries uh, were her favorite. Uh, shadow was, you know, if we, I, I think it does symbolize shadow. And mm-hmm. shadow was not so big, it wasn't so bad, and so blackberries could be yummy and delicious. But now uh, her neediness has become threatening, uh, as mm-hmm. symbolized by this mutated blackberry that starts to crawl up her leg and wants to cling to her. Uh, it, it's adhesive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's exactly the life issue that she has been contending with, you know, after having had a meltdown after finishing school. Right. Uh, she needed care at, at a time in life when it's hard to be yeah. in a kind of regressed or dependent state. It's like, no, I'm, I'm right. in my 20s now, let's say, and, and I'm supposed to be, quote, unquote, supposed to uh, be independent and so on. And that's kind of hinted at earlier in the dream because her mother is sort of showing her what to do when the mother goes mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The vegetables that are in the garden are the beautiful flowers and then these perfect oranges and tomatoes. But then there's the renegade blackberry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the you know, shadow and the, element. And the blackberry, <laughs> yeah, and, the, and, and as per shadow, it's humping her leg. So there's something about yep. sexual instincts, maybe. <laughs> but also, you know, we could we could wonder where that is, and also that um, a desire for the sex act is a desire for union. So the the little mutated blackberry wants to join with her. <laughs> it's looking for a conjunctio. I'm resonant with all the things that you had said. By her own admission, she had gone back to home because she had regressed. She had had a meltdown. When we have a meltdown, that's a way of saying that we've kind of lost our adult stance around something or other. And we go back to an earlier psychological state, often temporarily. And when we're back in a child mode, it's wonderful if there's an opportunity to be cared for as we work our way back up to the adult stance. In the beginning, it's such a wonderful Demeter-Persephone moment. Mm. Mm. When the mother oh, is, yeah. has all of this skill and largesse, and her garden is full of beauty and flowers and fruit, and she wants to make sure that the daughter partakes of these wonderful things and doesn't waste them, you know, eat the right fruit, don't let it just go to waste on the vine, right. but participate in the bounty. So there's this um, idealistic, wonderful process at the beginning. And then the mother is, or the dream mother, is preparing her just for a little bit of independence. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm leaving you my garden. Here's some things to take care of while we're away. And the dream ego's having trouble getting hold of her own agency, yeah. how to manage the garden of her life and to reap the bounty of that. And then these odd things begin to happen that perhaps the mother might have known how to handle. But the important thing is that nothing bad actually does mm-hmm. happen. Mm-hmm. It's unnerving, but there's <laughs> really no injury. It's just strange and uncanny. You know, Joseph, I, I didn't even think about <laughs> Persephone, but that's a beautiful amplification because we, we really are right there in this in this wonderful Demeter place with this fru- fruitful garden. And and in that sense, then the little blackberry is a is a little piece of Hades coming along saying, Time to separate from mom. And it seems not inappropriate that she would have this dream as she's starting to feel better. She says, I was feeling better. I was going outside more. So then the awareness must have been pressing forward that I'm going to have to go back out on my own. I'm feeling better. It's coming. And that's, I think, carried in the replanting of the blackberry bush. Mm. Is that something yeah. has to be moved. It's, yeah. it's no longer in the right place. It's not going to thrive where it was in the garden. So we're going to move Mm -hmm. it out over here, ostensibly different soil, sun conditions, and it'll grow better. 
and that she's also, you know, one of these bushes, as are all our children, that have to mm-hmm. kind of be transplanted out into their lives, into mm-hmm. new careers, the city that they're going to go into, but that she needs to do that. The mother's not going to dig up the blackberry bush. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She needs to dig it up, and she also needs to decide where it's going to be moved ostensibly. She has to make the best decision, and there's an old <laughs> aphorism, you know, bloom where you're planted. Yeah. And the problem, of course, is that um, replanting the blackberry bush is one thing, but what if the darn thing goes out of control? And I think that's the fear. What if it just takes on a life of its own? And blackberry canes do have a tendency to do that. <laughs> the last amplification I'd like to offer is from the myth of Inanna, which is an old Mesopotamian myth, and I won't reproduce it here. But there's a particular part of the myth where one of the gods picks out some soil from under their nails and they make a tiny little dark, faceless humanoid figure. (laughs) And they send it down into the underworld to accomplish a mission. And these little figures go into the underworld and they meet with Erishkigal, but their role is to perfectly mirror what's happening in the underworld goddess, which is important and helps her grieve. Mm-hmm. So if I fantasize about that, somehow magically, one of the gods has sent a little mm-hmm. faceless dark humanoid figure and what it's mirroring in her is this kind of instinctive sexuality, which mm-hmm. is just what you're saying, Lise. And while her conscious mind doesn't recognize that, the figures are actually reflecting something inside of her and showing it back to her that she finds agitating Mm -hmm. and also not congruent with the young child position. Right. You can only be a child in your mother's garden for so long. Right. Right. And often sexuality is the thing that drives us out of the home. Yeah, absolutely. As it does in the wild. Yep. The desire to mate and reproduce Mm -hmm. causes creatures to go off and seek their fortunes and their mates. Mm-hmm. It often encourages all of us as young people to go out and find appropriate places You've been listening to adventure to this with our sexuality. Life. From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, back help us produce position. future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.